this week we're going to be talking about the fourth step, which is made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Shauna, what does that mean to you? I had to dig deep and really think about what was really the cause of all my alcoholism and all other stuff and came down to fear and I had to be fearless to deal with it. James, what does that mean to you? It made me realize that I had a lot of fear in myself, that I was uh, like a scared little boy. And uh, because of that fear, um, it caused anger, and my anger caused resentment. And, um, so it made me deal with that and, and learn that I was the cause of, you know, take my part in the problem. I guess so. Steve, what does it mean to you? Uh, the fourth step to me is a fact-finding mission uh, to find out what's blocking me or what has been blocking me from God and God's will. Um, I need to acknowledge the resentments and find out what um, I had to do with that resentment. Jason? It's uh, figuring out the what's, why's, and who's of um, my of what's keeping me in my addiction and um, learning to figure out how to let those go. Sarah, what does it mean to you? To me, it means um, getting honest with myself and finding, like you say, the why behind the what and putting pen to paper. And um, for me, it actually was the, I hate the step the first time I work it, but in the end, it's become my favorite because I can actually see the patterns in my behavior, which illustrate the things that I'm dealing with, which is usually fear and anger and a lot of inner turmoil that I had no idea I even had until I worked the fourth step. So the fourth step deals with fear, as you just heard, and resentment and many other things. And it's about being searching and fearless. And you need help doing that. And it takes a pen and a paper. So this week we're going to talk about how to do that with the tools that God has given us. It's going to be awesome. It's important to me that you hear from the community on people that actually have worked the steps and the people in that room um, have long-term sobriety and that being said um, and, and, and not all of them by any means but the, the, the common denominator um, I can't believe I'm actually up here at 710 it's been 745 the last couple of weeks God is good <laughs> but um, but the common denominator is is really working a thorough um, four step I gave one of my friends um, uh, the big book tonight in my office and I told her she's got two weeks to write a thorough four step and those of you who have worked it from the big book or celebrate recovery NA's got a way to work it I'm sure GA's got to work it you just don't want to do it the way you think it should be done you want to do it the way it works and and, and like I've said in previous weeks um, Josh Templin I believe it was him that had a, a pretty good revelation um, now this is this is my addiction and it's just a mass chaos so if I work the first step I take a step above my addiction and I can see it for what it is and I admit that I'm powerless and my life had become unmanageable. Once I begin to look at the addiction and, and see the unmanageability and see the powerlessness, I can see when I said I was going to stop and I didn't stop. I, I, I re, on the 11 treatments I've been to, I see where, where I said I would never use again and I was using within a week. Um, I see how um, unmanageable my previous attempts at recovery were when I worked my program, not the program. And they say in AA that the first step is the only step that you have to work as close to perfect as possible. Now, if I take another step, I come farther away from my addiction. And now I've already admitted that I was powerless and unmanageable. My, my active addiction is down here. And, and now I can see things a little differently. And I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Now, there's a big difference in the length of the, the floor. It's wide in range. The, the length of this step, I think, is around probably 8 to 12 inches. That tells me I can't stay on this step long. I don't have a lot of wiggle room up here. In my addiction, I was here. I was there. I was up in the rafters peeking and geeking and tweaking. 
But when I get in here, there's not much room for me to move, so I gotta pay attention to what this really means. Now on the second step, there's not a lot of room. So I, 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 want, I can't go to step three until I work step one and two, but this is where I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Now I have to remind myself I've already admitted that my life was unmanageable. I had to admit that I was powerless. Now, and, and, and I thought the insanity was all that stuff, but truly the insanity is in between my two ears. And what's in between my two ears is what I identify and work with on the four step. So now I notice that, you know, my shoes barely even fit on the second step. So it tells me if I stay here too long, I can only do so much. I can only run back and forth on this platform for so long. It doesn't give me a lot of wiggle room. But when I go to the third step and I remind myself of what was that life was like, I remind myself that I admitted I was powerless and my life had become unmanageable. I remind myself that I, I can't deny the results in the room, so I do believe that uh, power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. But this step now has the same broad range of opportunity in canvas as the ground that I came from. It's the third step that I'm on now that isn't 12 inches long. It's the third step that opens me up to endless opportunities where I can go. See, I, I always think that God is like an a evil ruler and he wants me to be a robot and walk this straight, narrow line. That's not true. God wants you to be happy. So now I'm up on the third step and I'm not like going like this like I was on the one and two, but I can kind of move around a little bit and I'm exploring and discovering what making a decision really looks like and, 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 and to turn my will and my life over to care of God. Now, I have to remind myself that I admitted I was powerless and my life was unmanageable. I have to remind myself that some guy just got a year. I don't know who he is. I think I might have known him from the streets. So if he can do it, I can do it. And now I'm going to make a decision. And this time, it don't matter what's happened up until this point. This time, I'm going to stick to it. I'm not going to take my decision back. And a decision is always birthed by action. See, the fourth step says, made. See, we're good fakers. You can fake that you're on step one. No one would know the wiser. You can fake that you're on step two and no one would know the wiser. You can even fake that you're on step three and no one would know the wiser. But you can't fake step four because step four makes you do a little journaling. That's why service is important from day one. Because if you've been up serv of service before you get to step four, you now have built some internal endurance so you can actually take a look at yourself. But if you've been faking it, you're going to sit. I, I don't understand. I've been on step four for six months. You haven't even worked to step three if you're on step four for six months. And the truth hurts. Because if you truly have made a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God, as you understand, you can't wait to get rid of this stuff. It don't feel right anymore. So it says, um, made, that means I have to do something. Oh my God, now they're going to see that I'm just faking it. I'm not ready for the fourth step. But it says, made a searching. We're not good at, only thing we're good at searching for is dope. We do not like to take a look at ourselves. You will not be able to do a four step on your own strength. That's why you have to work a third step and tap into God's power to take a look at yourself. The reason why you're on it for six months is because you're operating in willpower thinking you're going to dig deep and we've never done that. Searching, say searching. And fearless, say fearless. fearless, moral inventory of ourselves. We are, we got it down. I can take your inventory. I can take your inventory. I'm sizing you up. I'm sizing you up. I'm a private eye with you. What's their motives? What's his? And the bottom line is my motives stink. And that's what I learned about myself in step four. So you got to get to know yourself so you can see yourself coming. It says, made, that means I got to do this. And, and pages, I read, you know, I just went through the book with this gal, my friend, and I said 60 to 63. And, and, and now right here, it'll show you how to do the categories in the big book. But, but the key is this. 
that, that, that we really need to be of service by this point. Otherwise, this step will become overwhelming. Because if you've been of service up until this point, you've already done what you didn't want to do so you can do what you want to do. But if you've done only what you wanted to do and faked the first step three, you're not going to want to look at yourself because you don't know how to look at yourself. See, check out what the literature says. And, and it says step four is a vigorous and painstaking effort. It, this is going to be painful. If it isn't painful, you're really not working it. I, I got a couple friends in treatment right now in jail. Mike Shea went to jail with Pastor Jed up in Rush City. They passed out hundreds of devotionals that they wrote and to, to, to prisoners in Rush City. Now, the majority, a lot of those guys know us. They've been in the rooms with us. They've heard me speak in places that they were in treatment in. I don't want to do that. I don't want to live my life in hindsight. Because once you get locked up, you wish you were in this room. Amen. So since you're in this room, take full advantage. So what it says is a vigorous and pain, it's got, there's a purpose behind the pain to discover these liabilities. But a lot of us, you know, we're so, we, we mask our low self-worth with pride. So we think we know what, I mean, it just, it baffles me how somebody like myself with all 11 treatments, a 35-year-old man with little boy issues could still think he knew what he was doing. And I, like I said in step three, you got you to gotta challenge your level of intellect. Who in their right mind would do the things that I did? I wasn't. That was the insanity in step two. The insanity in step, but it says liabilities in each of us have been, have been and are. See, the liabilities in us that step four wants us to look at are not gone because we quit drinking. They're still there. It says we want to find exactly how, when, and where our natural desires have warped us. I got some jacked up natural desires. I've learned that I can feel however I want to feel. My feelings aren't right or wrong. They're just mine, but I can't act on them. And it says, our natural desires have warped us. I was warped. We wish to look squarely at the unhappiness this has caused others and ourselves. This affects more than just you. It affects more than just you. And in the fourth step, it's challenging us to look at the unhappiness has caused. But here's how I used to operate. I was good at the restart button. I knew how to restart. I didn't want to look at that stuff. It's over. It's, the past is the past. But I had to look back to move forward. I always wanted to move forward without looking back. But the key is um, straining towards what is ahead, pressing towards the mark, as the Bible says. So I needed help to look back because I wasn't good at looking. It says, by discovering what are emotional deformities. Too many of us got too much pride to admit that we got emotional deformities. But we do. They're real and they're active and they, 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 are, they, they, they operate. It says we can move towards their correction. You, you can't correct something that you don't think is wrong. You have to target what is wrong and then you can correct it. But if you pretend that it doesn't exist and you just hit restart every time you get sober, you always will go back to where you said you were never going to return to. And this is really, the, as it says, the step that separates the men from the boys and the women from the girls. Check this out. Without a willing and persistent effort to do this, there can be little sobriety or contentment for us. Now, if I'm not content in my sobriety, I ain't going to stay sober. I mean, Skronik says it all the time. Every day is an adventure. You roll with us, man, and you never know what's going to happen on a given day. I mean, God knows what you need. When you make that decision to turn your life, but check out what it says. Without a searching and fearless moral inventory, most of us have found that faith, which really works in daily living, is still out of reach. The reason why faith is out of reach is because there's too much blockage. Resentments are blockage. Fears are blockage. And the, the, the remaining steps, that's why it says in step 12, not step 6, not step 9, not step 10, Step 12 is when the blockage is removed when you can truly have a spiritual awakening. If fears and resentments and all these things are consuming you, it's going to be hard to really walk a life of faith. 
It says, this being so, we think it logically follows that sobriety, first, last, and all the time, is the only thing we need to work for. When does it ever refer to addiction after the first step? And we think our problem is alcohol, or, or drugs, or gambling, or sex. And, and that's what AA is teaching us here. It says, we believe that no one-time good characters will be revived the moment we quit alcohol. Now I don't lie because I don't drink. How's that working for you? <laughs> I, I, I don't drink, so I don't get angry anymore. The stuff's still there without the alcohol. And that's what the remaining steps identify. It says, if we are pretty nice people all along, except for our drinking, what need is there for moral inventory now that we are sober? There's a big need for it. And if you really read what the big book has to say here, um, this is the 12 and 12, but they say the resentment is the number one offender. Check out now what it says. It goes on to say, we also clutch at another wonderful excuse for avoiding our inventory. Our present anxieties and troubles, we cry, are caused by the behavior of other people. It's their fault. I'm this way because of them. That's a victim mentality. And if you have a victim mentality, there'll be many victims that are a victim of your mentality. See, we got to understand um, what you resent, you become. And, and check out what it says here. Um, it, it's their fault. It ain't my fault. It's this. I mean, if you give somebody so much power to make you feel a certain way, you have turned your life over to a person, not God. Why would you turn your life over to a person you resent? Again, intellect. Do I do it? Yes. To this day. And thank God for a 10th step. We're not perfect. So, but this information is revelation that re leads to transformation. Check this out now. Check, this is awesome information. I love this. It says, people who really, I don't need to do an inventory. You do. You're the reason why I feel like I do. I blame Skronik. Now, Skronik, he's got his popcorn and his lazy boy every night sleeping like a baby. But I'm up at 2 in the morning blaming him. Intellect. Intellect. We have to work on our intellect. Check this out. Therefore, we think that our indignation is justified and reasonable, that our resentments are the right kind. We aren't the guilty ones. They are. Um, tonight, I want you to think about what you think about other people. Think about what you think about other people. And then you will know how much of a captive you are. Now, there are things that should make you angry. But it's not okay to stay angry. Because you're the only one that gets hurt when you get angry. Now, if you're that angry and you go beat somebody up, well, you're still going to jail. Or you're angry and you go drink some and you go get a DW, you're still get, going to jail. And, and what it says now, and again, intellect, it says, and with a genuine alarm at the prospect of work, Oh, i got to make this inventory. Well, I have been serving since I worked the first step, since I got out of treatment, jail, or the dope house. So I have built my endurance. So now I'm ready to work this. But if you have not been of service, you have no endurance. You're still doing what you want to do when you want to do it. And if you do what you want to do, you will end up doing what you don't want to do. Didn't you come here because you didn't want to do that anymore? Check out what it says. I mean, it's just spot on. We, we, you know, you hear me say it all the time. If you're lazy in your recovery, you'll get put to work in your relapse. Now check out. We loaf and procrastinate. At our best work, grudgingly, under half steam. Oh, I gotta go to another meeting. I gotta get out of Serenity Village, man. These meetings are killing me. No, they're not killing you. They're keeping you alive. You got to get to the level of intellect to say that I don't have to be here. I get to be here because where Pastor Jed and Mike were today in Rush City, they don't get to be here tonight. The people we have buried over the last several years that are in the ground don't get to be here. I just got my mother-in-law's gravestone purchased today. See, see, there's people that would die to be here, but there's people that are dying here. And there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. And, and what it says now, it says, you know, 
it's so important that this information is digested. It says these fears are termites that ceaselessly devour the foundation of whatever sort of life we want to build. Once we have complete willingness to take an inventory and exert ourselves to do the job thoroughly, a wonderful light falls upon a foggy scene. Why did I have to wait to get locked up or in treatment to feel peace? Why do I have to get in a fight with my wife and the only time I'm happy back in the day is after a big fight? I'm addicted to chaos. I'm not addicted to peace. I, I, peace is foreign to me. I said this to an individual earlier today. You're, you're, you, you know, we become successful at failing. And, and, and what it says here is so important. A wonderful falls on the foggy scene, the doom and gloom. This, oh, I can't. I got to stay sober in the rest of my life. <laughs> no, you don't. You just got to stay sober today. And it says, as we persist, a brand new kind of confidence. I was in getting my hair cut. Um, Ross was giving me a hard time. He thought my barber lived at my house in group last week or the other week. But I, I watched this lady in the hair, hair place, and she was saying, this is the longest minute of my life. I can't wait to get off work. If you live your life looking at minutes, wondering when you can punch the clock to go home to misery, life is too short. And I'm not judging her, but I just, I thought, I mean, there's days that I'm like, God, extend time, extend time. I got six more meetings. I got to go do this. I got to study. You see, when you get in true freedom, you can really walk out the life that God has for you. But, but check out what it says. If we, as we persist, a brand new kind of confidence is born, and the sense of relief at finally facing ourselves is indescribable. See, the problem is we've been running from ourselves. And the fourth step makes us face, face ourselves. These are the first fruits of step four. Now, where do they get that? The Bible, the first fruits. The most common symptoms are emotional insecurity. Worry, anger, self-pity, and depression. These stem from causes which sometimes seem to be within us and other times come from without. To, to, to make an inventory in this respect, we ought to consider carefully all personal relationships which bring continuous or recurring trouble. My relationships were screwed up because I was in them. But you would have never heard me say that back in the day. I would have blamed the person why it was screwed up. It says, but it is from our twisted relations with family, friends, and society at large that many of us have suffered. The That's why I never could forget. Families drop off their kids here. I mean, and I'm talking 50-year-old kids, 60-year-old kids, 70-year-old kids. <laughs> but the kids tell the family they're okay. And they forget how twisted it was. And they go back to something that ain't healed yet. And they shortchange the miracle because they're in a hurry to recover. I used to go home, I'd go into a sober house after treatment, and I'd be super dad making up for lost time because I felt so guilty that I was away from the kids just to stay there for 60 days and be missing again. It's so important that we've got to learn this truth about ourselves. And, and, and what it's saying here, in respect, we ought to consider carefully all personal relationships with bring this continuously recurring trouble. I'm not going to have people that bring me recurring trouble in my life today. Life is too precious. When you show up, what do you bring with you? When people get you, what do they get? Back in the day, what I brought to the table was resentment and fear. And they got chaos. See, check out what the literature says. The most common symptoms, it says the most scary. But it, it is a twisted family. We have been especially stupid and stubborn. Now, I didn't say it. AA did. <laughs> About them. The primary fact that we fail to recognize this is a total inability to form a true partnership with another human being. We can't get authentic. Chuck didn't know how to take me when I hug him. Tell him I love him. Now we have an authentic relationship. If you live your whole life without one authentic relationship, you haven't lived. You have to have, it won't be a broad group of people, but a small group of people that you can just be you in. The good side of you, the not so good side of you, the scared side of you, the worried side of you. You, you know, there's too many pretenders around. 
We have not once sought to be at one with family. See, there's people in our program right now that aren't even at one with the program in us. It ain't going to work. You're on borrowed time. I, I, I hate to tell you the truth. I've been doing this for 13 years. I've got thousands of examples. If you're not at one with what is happening here, this will not work for you. It will not work. And for those of you who are guests, if you're not at one with your AA or NA club or GA club, it probably won't work. And that's what the literature says. It says, to be a worker among workers, to be useful member of society. Now it says in NA it works how and why. It says, by working the first three steps, we have formed a solid foundation in our recovery. Now, have you really, though? Or is it just a facade? And, and, and the literature is going to address that here in a moment. But you, can, you need God's help to make a thorough, fearless and thorough moral inventory of yourself. You need God's help. See, if you don't have the solid foundation, and don't use that as an excuse to stay stuck because it's available to you, our active addiction cannot be arrested. Do you understand that I, as I stand here in front of you tonight in my flesh, my addict inside of me is in jail? It's been arrested. But sometimes I go to the jailer, the devil, and get the key from him. And I let that bad boy out. The only power the devil has is the power that you give him. See, check out what it says here. So, so you know, uh, when the addict starts talking to you from jail inside of you, say, hey, man, you're doing a life sentence. You can't touch me unless I allow you to touch me. But a lot of times we give the addict inside of us the key. And, and I have to remind myself through James 4, 7, and 8 that I'm not going to be double-minded. But it says, however, unless we build upon this foundation, as we work the third step, many of us were puzzled. How could we be sure by really turning our will and our lives over to the care of God? The, ample, the answer is simple. It's a simple program for complicated people. The answer to that question is as simple as, how can you be sure if you turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand Him, how can you be sure of that? By working the remainder of the steps. So if you haven't done that, you have not worked step three. And, and, it, and it's so important to get. But some of us are still haunted by a driving obsession to use drugs. I talked about that last week in step three. God will give me a new desire to replace my desire to get high. My desire to serve Him, my, my desire to turn my life and my will, and that's a process. But I know what it's like to have a driving obsession to use drugs in my recovery. It is hell. Every day I got that stuff on my mind. But God has released me of that. It doesn't mean that the thoughts don't come, but the obsession is gone. If you stick around these rooms long enough, that will happen. Others find that feelings of discomfort are, are more subtle. A nagging feeling that something isn't quite right. Check this out. See, there's two things that are happening here. Either some of us have this driving obsession. I can't, I can't drink, 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 I can't use, I can't use, I can't use, I can't go to the casino, I can't go to the zoo, I can't look at my phone, I can't go to the porn, I can't look at the porn. And my whole day, my whole day is I can't, I can't, I can't. No, recovery says you can do all things. Recovery doesn't limit you. But I love what this says here because it's so true. There's two things that happen to an individual if they're heading to relapse. The driving obsession to use is so strong, they, they're not working the steps, they're not being honest and vulnerable because they don't know James 5, 16, where it says confess your faults, your thought life, and the King James to one another so you can be healed. And after you do that and you become authentic and real by doing the fifth step, then God says then your prayers will be powerful and effective. But check out what it says. Some of us maybe do not have that driving obsession to use anymore. We, we, it's not on our mind like it once was. But we have this nagging feeling that something isn't quite right. A sense of impending doom or feelings of fear and anger for no apparent reason. That means you are heading for relapse. And you have to arrest this by doing a fourth and a fifth. See, see, it's so important that, that, that we really do that. It says the solution to our problem is a profound change, not just a little change, a profound change to our thinking and our behavior. Check this out. 
we need to change how we perceive the world and alter our role in it. Two steps. First, you need God to help you change the perception of the world you live in. And you will not be able to change your behavior until your perception changes. And typically, perception is tied to attitude. But what it's saying here is so important because it just nails it on the head here. And, 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 and it's, it's profound. It says we need to change our attitude. We are embarking on a search for insight into ourselves. And you ain't going to like everything you find. Our feelings, our fears, our resentments, the patterns of behavior that make up our lives. What is meant by searching in fearless moral inventory? We take stock of our assets and liabilities. I like what NA does here because it's talking also on assets. It says we try to get to the bottom of who we are to expose the lies we've told ourselves about ourselves. You're your own worst critic. And if you are your own worst critic, all people do that live that life, all they do is criticize other people. Because if you're criticizing yourself constantly, you are criticizing anybody who is around you and you have not worked a fourth and a fifth step. But, but check this out, it, it's so important that, that we say, I got to expose the lies. I'm, mi I'm, I'm a failure. I'm miserable. Those are lies. You're not a failure just because you failed. I'll never amount to nothing. That's a lie. You will amount to something. You have to expose these lies going on in your head to some other human being. My wife will never love me. Uh, I'm trapped. This is not going to happen. My boss will never appreciate me. I'll never make the money that I once did. I'll never get my family back. They're all lies. But you're the only one listening to them. You ain't talking about them with anybody else. You're just listening to the lies. And pretty soon the lies become your reality. See, we, we, will, we will accept a lie and we will push away the truth. Check out what it says. It says, for years we become whoever we needed to be to survive in our addiction. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is what I want to hit. I'm going to hit it. I'm going to hit it right between your eyes. Some of you are still like that in your recovery. You are whoever you need to be in this room. As soon as you get out of this room, you're somebody else. And while you're here, you're pretending that you're engaged in this, but you can't wait to get the heck out of here. So you thought you were a chameleon in your addiction? You're a chameleon, and I'm not saying to anybody in I I'll say it to me. I was a chameleon in the rooms. There's a difference between compliance and surrender. I'm just a robot in my recovery doing what you think I should do, and I hate what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it because I don't want you on my back. I'm not going to tell you what really lies. And, it, and it's just a chameleon attitude. I got guys in my group all the time that you can tell with their body, body language and their behavior that they are just repulsed to be here. So why are you here? You're not a bad person. You're not a fraud. You just haven't worked a fourth and a fifth. The stuff that keeps us sick is still in us. Check this out. It says, after living a lifetime of lies, we began to believe those lies. Our experience tells us that self-centered fear is the most root of our disease. Many of us have pretended to be fearless. Go to the county jail. Go to the prisons. I go there often. You see all fear in there. And people walking around. <laughs> Full of fear. Fear makes you do crazy things. Fear makes you lash out and say things you wish you wouldn't have. Fear, fear makes you steal. Fear, fear makes you... No. And, and that's, that's the whole thing. We pretend that we're fearless, but we're really just full of fear. When in fact, we were terrified. Fear has driven us to act rashly, trying to protect ourselves. Have any of you ever tried to save somebody that's drowning? When I try to help people and they bat me away, I say they're drowning. If you ever tried to, to help a wounded animal, they bite you. Try to help somebody in these rooms that doesn't want to get help, they're going to bite you. They're going to, they're going to bat you away. And I used to be one of those people. But I do not want to be that person anymore. We use people. That's what I'm saying to chameleons. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. 
man, I've never heard recovery like this. I'm going to get a sponsor. I'll show up for sandwiches. It's going to be awesome. Thank you for the job. I really appreciate it. You do. This is places I've never seen a place like this before. I mean, geez, I'm so excited about lies. I mean, you think God would pick a person to lead this thing that didn't say all those things? <laughs> I mean, it's like just say what you mean. You know, I mean, it's just let's just get real. You know, I would respect it if you told me you want nothing to do with God. And, you know, like I told you last week, I'm, I'm really having good dialogue with this guy who was boldly told me he was an atheist at Super America. I go in there one, two in the morning every night. And, and he goes, well, you're a pastor. You know, how's Bible study? I said, it's great. He goes, well, you know I'm an atheist. I said, well, okay. And I said to him, I said, well, it's, you know, you tell me you're an atheist and it sounds like you get, you're a man of high level of conviction. Because if more of us that have faith stood up like he does about his lack of faith, this world would look a lot different. But I said to him, I said, what if you're wrong? I said, because if, if I believe in God, in Jesus, and I'm wrong, what's, I know I'm not wrong, but, but what's the ramification of that? But if you're wrong about that, there is a result at the end of that. Intellect. Intellect. See, see what, what it's saying here is, is this literature is so profound. I love... See, you always want to use the tools that God makes available to you to get sober and free. Um, and, and, and what it's saying here, you know, it says, fear, we act rashly. We use people, we manip manipulated, we lied, we plotted, we planned, we stole, we cheated, and we lied some more to cover up the schemes. You think this is work? Let me repeat what I just read. Working a program is nowhere near the work of doing this. We planned, we plotted, we manipulated, we stole, we cheated, we lied, and then we lied some more. We experience envy, jealousy, deep, gut-wrenching insecurities. Never be envious of somebody that's doing better than you. Learn from them. Glean to them. Respect them. Appreciate it. They don't have to help you. Are you paying them to help you? Intellect. Intellect. See, see, the literature is so profound. It says, we make a list of resentments, for they often play a large part in making our recovery uncomfortable. We cannot allow ourselves to be obsessed with the hostility towards others. We get so hostile towards people, and they don't even know we're hostile to them. We size them up. We judge them. We, we, we say there's more than meets the eye, and who does he think he is, or who does she think she is? Well, that may be the person that God has selected to save your life. And why wouldn't the devil get you twisted towards that person? Because the devil doesn't want you close to that person. The devil wants you to envy and be jealous and, and be fearful of that person because that's the person that God has selected. Intellect. And a basic text. A written inventory will unlock parts of your subconscious. A lot of the stuff we do, trust me, I've been analyzed and everything on couches. I, I used to pay, some of you know this, when I got out of Hazelden, I went to their top psychiatrist I, I, my insurance had ran out, and I paid the psychiatrist $150 cash an hour to lie to him. <laughs> now, who was the fool? <laughs> intellect. Not a high level of intellect. A written inventory can unlock parts of our subconscious. A lot of times we don't know why we do what we do. That's the purpose of the steps, to unlock it. That remain hidden when we simply think about or talk about who we are. Start talking about who you are. Once it, it, it's all down on paper, it is much easier to see and much harder to deny our true nature. Honest self-assessment is one of the keys to our new way of life. Um, I'm not capable of being honest when I first got here, so I needed somebody to help me. I needed somebody to teach me how to be honest. And that was vulnerable to say that to another man. I don't know how to be honest. I lie to myself. I will lie to you. So just I need accountability. I need somebody to help me be honest because a white lie is still a lie. Sometimes I don't even know why I used to lie. There was no fruit on the end of the lie. 
And a lot of times when we lie, it's to make ourselves look better. In step four, we begin to get in touch with ourselves. We write down our liabilities such as guilt, shame, remorse, self-pity, resentment, anger, depression, frustration, confusion, loneliness, anxiety, betrayal, hopelessness, fear of failure, and denial. A lot of times in these rooms, I deal with people with heavy betrayal issues, and they end up leaving us before they think we're going to leave them. But we're still here. And the door and the light's been on for 13 years. And it's available to anybody. It's available to anybody who wants it. And, 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 what it's a, and if you look now, and, and again, I've been psychoanalyzed, psychologist, psychiatrist, everything comes down to fear. Anger is a secondary emotion to fear. Now, I want to read these words one more time, and I believe that the thread of fear is laced in each and every one. Guilt, fear. Shame, fear. Remorse, there's a fear in there. Self-pity, there's a fear. Resentment, there's a fear. Anger, there's a fear. Depression, there's a fear. Frustration, there's a fear attached to it. Confusion, loneliness, anxiety, betrayal. It's all tied to fear. What do they say about fear? False evidence appearing real. They also say, forget everything and run. Or you have a choice to face everything and recover. See, fear is not as bad as we make it out to be. We write out the things that bother us in the here and now. We have a tendency to think negatively. I'll read that again. We have a tendency to think negatively, so putting it on paper gives us a chance to look more positively at what is happening. Um, and, and, and the thing is that the fear makes you do some crazy things. Assets must be cons also considered. Just because you did bad doesn't mean you are bad. You're not bad. Just because you made or I made some mistakes doesn't mean I am a mistake. So, so we have to look at, there's, there's, I mean, I'm telling you, there is so much untapped talent in this room right now. And it's only the 12 steps that are going to unlock it. It's only the spiritual awakening, and it's only but what you do for another person is what God will do for you. And you, when you are a heavy servant, never expect for people to do for you what you're doing for them. I mean, I only got one guy in this room that has done more for me than I've done for him. He's here right now, and he struggles with the same thing I do. He says, who's got my back? God's got your back. And who better than God? to have your back. This is very difficult for most of us because it's hard to accept that we have good qualities. However, we have assets, many of them newly found in the program, such as being clean. Well, wow, I'm clean. Open-minded. I, I was always so closed-minded. God awareness. Honesty with others. I'm honest. Acceptance. You know, if that happened, I can't control it. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Acceptance. Acceptance. And, and, and check out what it says. It's so profound. Um, positive action, sharing, willingness, courage, faith, caring, gratitude, kindness. That's what I experienced on Tuesday night with about 30 men. All those qualities. Some of those men don't even know what, who they are, but they carry a great deal of wisdom. And they have heart. Each and every one of you have these things inside of you waiting to come out of you. And inventory becomes a relief because the pain of doing it is less than the pain of not doing it. See, either way, there's going to be pain. The pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. It says we learn that pain, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've had to walk 13 years of pain in these rooms. When you're dealing with people, you deal with pain. I had a guy, I thought he was the real deal, and the next thing you know, he's gone. It was painful. It hurt my heart. But I got to keep living by principle. It says, thus, facing it becomes unavoidable. Face it now or face it later. Don't you wish you wouldn't have faced it? You would have faced it in your first treatment? I wasted 20 some years, but they weren't wasted because without those 20 years of addiction, this place wouldn't exist. I had to lose everything to gain everything. And, and, and it's, a, it's unavoidable, so look at it. The stress once trapped inside of you is released. Writing will lift, li lift the lid off of the pressure cooker. We decide whether we want to serve it up, put the lid back on, or throw it out. We no longer have to stew in it. 
I mean, Gene is here right now. He, he, you know, Gene, stand up. Where are you? Stand up. Let's give him a hand. Now, now a lot of you know the story. Gene's daughter, Gina, is dead. She died in her addiction a couple years ago. I asked Gene tonight, where's Sue, his wife? Sue comes here faithfully. And, and, and I said, well, she's not. I respect that you're here by yourself. I respect the fact that when your wife told this group of people, if all of us were to put our pot, problems in a pot, you'd take yours back out. I told an individual in my office, she was complaining, I mean, no disrespect, you know I love you, but overwhelmed is a better word, about her bills. I said, I'll exchange my bills with yours. <laughs> I respect you, and you are carrying the legacy of your daughter who died in your addiction, and you're not even in recovery, and you're showing people like us that there is hope because you're here to get to know God. Let's give him a hand. So, so it, it, we don't have to stew in it. The important thing is that we do our best. Just like we gave our addiction our best and it turned out to be our worst, if you give your recovery your best, you will find out what's really in you. We use the tools. There's so many tools. I give you sheets. I mean, whatever you need, we'll give it to you. You go to the room, somebody will buy you a book, whatever you need. Available to us. To, oh, I, so now, check out the difference here. Intellect. I don't know why I'm on intellect tonight. <laughs> now... <laughs> If you <laughs> now, intellect tells me if I walk in, I, if I go decide to get high tonight, um, uh, and I walk in the dope house, they say, hey, hey, give me an eight ball, man. Just give it to me. You think they're going to give it to me? But I come in a room like this, and I say, hey, can you help me out? The answer is yes. Why are we attached to things that are hurting us? And we push away things that are designed to help us. It's so important that this stuff is all wrapped up in our unconscious, and it says we do not want to lose any of the ground. I've worked, I, I had a conversation with somebody last week, and they said to me, I see that you have worked hard to get to where you are. They said that to me. It blessed my heart. Because I have worked hard to get to where I am. And I got a long ways to go. But it is not an easy road. If it was, this would have a thousand people in it tonight. And some of you won't be back next week because you're not willing to look at this stuff. But what it says is, I don't want to lose ground. I, I'm, I'm a good rebuilder, but I'm not a good builder. Now I'm a builder. I'm building things. We want to continue with the program. It is our experience that no matter how you're search, how searching and thorough, no inventory is any lasting effect unless it's promptly followed up by an equally thorough fifth step. It says in Matthew 12, the time has come to look at yourself. The, the good man, the Bible says, brings up good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings up evil things out of the evil. Whatever is inside of you is eventually going to come out of you. Psalm 26, a life test will always prove what's inside of you. People call it true colors. The chameleons bob their heads like a bobblehead and pretend they like they agree and they're, this is, this is good, this is good. And they got a secret plan. And who loses? The chameleon. I was one of those people, and I lost. And I lost, and I lost, and I lost. But your, our true colors will always be proven under fire. Everybody loves Pastor Jeff until Pastor Jeff corrects them. I had lunch with one, some, one of my favorite people tonight, today, and, and, and she's one of those people that you know, we've been through some tough times. They helped build this church. And it, it was moving fast back then. And there was miscommunication. And it was, but you know what? She does not care how often she sees my wife and I. Because when we get together, it's like there was no time wasted. If you are depending on being noticed in a relationship and you don't know who that other person is that you're supposed to be tied to authentically, got another text for an individual I love deeply um, today who's here under the sound of my voice. She said to me, she said, well, I hope you meant what you said. I said, well, I've been saying what I mean for 13 years. Because I worked a fourth and a fifth step. I got rid of the anger. I got rid of the resentments. And it still comes back, and thank God for a tenth step. But the Bible says in Ephesians 4, anger is a secondary emotion to fear. 
In your anger, do not sin. A lot of times we allow our anger to take us out. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Too many, t- too many years of my life were wasted in resentments, going to bed angry, waking up angry, mad at the world, mad at my boss, mad at Pastor Jeff. See, the Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not spin out. Do not quit. Man up, woman up. And it says, if you go to bed angry, you will give the devil a foothold. And once the devil has got a foot into your life, do you think he's just, would you, if you got a foot in somebody's door, are you just going to stand here for a couple days? Huh? No. You're going in. And you're going in in every area of that person's life. The devil always takes you further than you want to go. And if you go to bed angry, you are giving him permission to have a foothold, which will turn into a stronghold, which will make you captive. And what it says as we close in Psalm 34, if you target your fears, because it's all about fears, God will remove them. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. When, where's Ryan? Where's the guy who met me in the parking lot tonight? Come here. I sought the Lord, and the Lord answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. Not some of my fears. When God removes all of the fears, that comes by working a fifth. By admitting to God yourself and another human being the exact nature of wrong. It comes by working the sixth. And became entirely ready to have God remove your defects of character. It comes with the seventh. Humbly asking God to remove your shortcomings. And it comes after working an eighth and a ninth by cleaning your side of the street. Tonight, I got a call. Sometimes I get a little worried about these calls. Pastor Jeff, there's a guy waiting for you out in the parking lot. (laughs) I said, where's Mike? (laughs) This man, not this boy. This man wanted to have a face-to-face with me. And I want to give him the microphone. This is not a boy. This is a man. And I think he can teach all the residents of Serenity Village something tonight as we close. Tell your brothers and sisters you were part of this program. What happened? You said you got resentful towards me. Now you came tonight, tonight to make an amends. Why did you do that? Uh, well, I was a part of this program, I think, 2015 it was, and um, I was pretty much using the entire time. Uh, I'm a heroin addict, and I overdosed in one of the houses, and you and your wife and the cops and the ambulance had to come, and uh, along with some other people, and I got kicked out. Um, and for a long time, you know, I just, I was mad, and I was like hurt, resentful as to why you or you guys didn't reach out. And uh, I realized that who am I to even think that I deserve that because I wasn't ready to get clean. I wasn't ready to hear you reach out to me. I wasn't, um, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to give my life up and I wasn't um, ready to surrender to the program. Um, And I had brought, you know, I brought the devil into the house, you know, I brought something that could have affected anybody else in that house, and uh, I just, I had to suffer more, and I needed more suffering, and uh, I finally had enough, and I gave my life up to Jesus Christ, and uh, so I came back here tonight to, to work through the steps and do um, my amends with you. And, uh, Give God a hand. <laughs> Love you, man. See, God is the great deliverer, but he never delivers you from something without trying to deliver you to something. He delivered Ryan to an amends. Ryan worked the ninth step with us tonight. I've been doing this for 13 years with thousands of lives. 
and probably a large percentage of those thousands of lives are resentful towards me. I can count on one hand how many people have come to make an amends. You, by one act of maturity, just gave me courage for another 10 years to help addicts and alcoholics. God bless you.